To all the panelists, I have a question here. Um, tell us a bit about your journey as a preacher of the gospel and how you developed into a preacher who is attentive to social issues. Let's begin with Pastor Yolanda Julies, and then we'll move on to uh, Kaylee Pelletier and then our good doctors, I know. So, Pastor Yolanda, how did your journey as a preacher begin and how did you develop into a socially attentive preacher of a gospel? Over to you. Dr. Batch, I just want to thank you for the kind introduction. Um, believe it or not, my journey started on the trains <laughs> and in the squares in Cape Town. Um, we've, um, I, I was 21 when I gave my heart to the Lord and a group of preachers who worked in Cape Town or believers who worked in Cape Town, we traveled um, in the morning and obviously you just had to start testifying and preaching Whatever you heard your pastor preach on Sunday, you would let go on the trains on, on the particular morning. Um, and that is how it grew. And eventually, um, our, we had lunchtime fellowship at the place where I worked at the time. And they I also um, had to preach and I had to, you know, teach. And my husband and I also started a youth ministry in our community in Cryfontein, where we um, encourage the youth. Um, and that also helped um, build that confidence when it came to preaching until we eventually planted the churches. And um, yeah, of course, um, now <laughs> we're preaching nearly um, a lot, should I say, and also raising preachers to be able to teach. Um, Social issues, um, I was a bit hesitant, you know, to to delve into um, and committing because of the needs around me and also, also because of the social, um, the situation that we found ourselves in, in the country and um, and how it impacted my own life. So to, to express that, I felt I needed to develop myself, to be able to, to voice what I was feeling in a biblical way, lest I become, um, you know, angered or so division or do anything that would not be pleasing unto the Lord because of what I was experiencing at the time when I was 21, of course, you know, we were um, still um, South Africa, the political atmosphere in South Africa was still that of seg separation, segregation, and um, and to preach in that environment would have meant that um, yeah, that I that I constantly open myself to um, you know just open the, the the feelings and the things that I myself couldn't um, biblically um, expound or explain. And that's why I held back. But now that I've gone through formalized studies, um, yeah, I've learned to express what, um, how I need to address the social issues. And I couldn't run away from this tearing in my spirit to, to speak about the injustices, to speak about what was going on in my surrounding community. And yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Julius, for uh, that description of your journey. Uh, I can imagine you on the trains. I would have wished to be one of your congregants uh, as we traveled to Cape Town with you delivering a sermon of uh, great, um, uh, yeah, well, of great insight. Thank you so much for that, Katie. Uh, what was your journey in developing as a preacher, and also how did you grow uh, in your attentiveness to uh, social issues? Over to you. Well, um, <clears throat> I grew up in a very small town in America, and so um, my little small town didn't seem to really have many problems, you know, life just kind of flowed, and um, I, as a kid, you're probably not very mindful anyway, but it was a fairly basic small town. And um, going to university is when your eyes start opening to um, some of the needs around, you know, and, and students started to... Um, volunteer with children's programs, feeding schemes, um, the homeless, um, you know, so you started getting a feel, oh, there's real problems out there in the world. 
Um, and, you know, in university, you're deciding, what is it that I'm going to commit my life to? And though I saw all these things around me, I thought, what's going to have the greatest eternal impact that I can commit my life to? And, and for me, the focus really zoned in on <clears throat> um, telling the gospel, preaching the gospel, and discipling God's people. And that is kind of as I narrowed down, that's what I want to focus my life on um, to have the greatest impact. And um, so, and even finances, I remember thinking, I, I want to give. There's so many programs you can give to and so many, you know, feeding these people or building homes here. And again, I said, no, actually, I want to focus even my finances on organizations that are preaching the gospel, organizations that are discipling. Um, so that is kind of where I committed to this um, one thing, um, went to training and all of those things. But <clears throat> like she was saying, you know, obviously you start to see as you have this focus, you start to see the problems of the world surrounding you. And as you're um, preaching to a certain group of people or teaching a certain group of people and seeing the, the struggles that they have, I, out of this overflow of the gospel comes this desire to want to help. You know, I, I think you just can't escape that desire um, to want to help those who have real needs. And, and um, so, yeah, so I guess I've always kept my eyes on, you know, preaching the gospel and discipleship, but there's always been an overflow, whether it's uh, starting a sewing project uh, for women who in Zimbabwe that where the unemployment is so high, that you know, women are struggling to support their families, and um, or whether it's taking on a, a group of kids from the local orphanage and bringing them into our church for our Sunday school program every week, week in, week out. Um, you know, reaching out to those uh, children in our community. I, it's it's always been for me out of an overflow of my heart um, for the gospel. Brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing uh, that with us. Um, I'm going to ask the same question uh, to Dr. Nzeno. Dr. Nzeno, tell us a bit about your journey as a preacher. How did you develop as a preacher of the gospel and how did you hone in your skill or your uh, gifting as a socially attentive preacher? Over to you. Thank you kindly, Dr. Manika. I'm glad the question from the first responder has become two-part question. Uh, I saw it as one question and I was interested in simply answering the latter part. But now that it's a two part, allow me to say this. I'm coming to you this afternoon from Bloemfontein and that I'm mentioning because this happens to be the very same place that shaped me. I led my first, I preached my first sermon around down the road from where I am and some of the people that I preached to. So it's quite significant to respond to this question at this conference to simply say, I think it's important to also mention how one received the gospel uh, shaped, or rather for me, it shaped who I am. It's, it's during the days of uh, big tents, uh, during the days of open airs, uh, during the days where someone could just knock at your door and come tell you about Christ. And those are the days that, grew, that I grew up in that shaped who I am and how I received the gospel and how I passed it. And so before I could put in a suit and, and tie and preach formally, I preach what you call informally across the street at school. I, I don't know how other people had their high school, but throughout my high school, I was called pastor. Uh, so it was not something that I got after I was ordained. But I think to capture that well, allow me maybe to mention this, that even the social ills of the day that we grew up in, I keep saying this to people that for us as uh, African boys in South Africa, we didn't go out looking for politics, for example. Politics found us playing soccer. Politics found us at school. And so the issues such as politics, the, whether it's, it's uh, poverty and other things, it's not something that we have to come out of ourselves to go look for. We lived with them. And I think that reality shapes one. That reality allows you to go to God, number one, before you could go to people, to go to God with these issues. And that became a pressure point in understanding my calling uh, to, to the Lord to say, are you calling me to do what about these things? So I'll leave it there. Hopefully I'll be able to elaborate uh, furthermore. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much uh, to uh, all our uh, speakers. It seems there's a common thread across uh, the three 
a sharing uh, to the first question, and that is the gospel. Uh, so the gospel seems to be the center a piece in your development as preachers and also in your social attentiveness or even in the way you respond to social issues. So that is appreciated and we have learned much from that one. So I'm going to switch gear here and have a more focused question to one of um, the panelists and I will speak to uh, to Katie Pelletier. And the question is around the biblical text that many quote or cite when speaking of uh, social issues. And it is Amos 5 verse 24, and I'll read uh, from the ESV, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. And they stop there. So the text is lifted out of a particular context and that is read and given as a proof text of social justice. Now, Katie, what is your understanding of this verse? And how would you interpret and preach it responsibly? Over to you. Thanks. Well, looking first at the contextual background, um, it's Israel that he's addressing God's covenantal community, and they were supposed to be upholding the law, the entire law. And intrinsic to the law are not only moral requirements on how to treat one another, but there were also civil laws on how society functions. And these civil laws uh, ensure that the poor will be looked after. It's built into the law, right? The, um, the gleaning of the fields <clears throat> to leave some for the poor. The widow will be looked after with this, these kinsman redeemer laws. Um, you know, one cannot be a victim to poverty and slavery forever because you have the year of Jubilee that cancels debts and makes sure uh, land is returned to the one who it originally belonged to, you know, not allowing someone to amass wealth. So that was intrinsically built into the, the moral and civil law. Um, and if the law was followed properly in this covenantal community, then justice and righteousness would occur 24-7. It would be constantly flowing. However, the root of the problem is the disobedience and the sin of the covenantal community. So we see they're breaking moral law, they're breaking civil law, they're, they're trampling on the poor, taking bribes to deprive the poor of justice, despising truth tellers, you know, loving evil, hating good. Um, so they're subverting justice and they could care less about personal righteousness. Yet Israel believes that by upholding parts of the ceremonial law, the sacrificial law, they're surely in good standing with, you know, with the Lord in his eyes. Um, so they were basically selectively choosing uh, which laws they were going to uphold and follow. So it's against that background um, that Amos is, is presenting this, this dirge, this funeral song, um, starting in verses 18 to 27, which is being sung over Israel in judgment of what's coming because of their unjust behavior, their unrighteous living, their failure to adhere to the entire law. Um, they falsely believed this day of the Lord that would come would be salvation for them because they're performing all their sacrifices and religious duties to God, you know. They're appeasing God, so surely they're safe from harm. And they're happily adopting the pagan thinking of the surrounding Canaanites who also thought you could appease your gods with your religious duties and live however immoral and unethically you wanted. So, but that's not what God desires. Um, you know, performing religious rigid, religious rituals and living as you please, discarding the rest of the law, which promotes right self-living and, and right treatment towards others. So, you know, if we actually are looking at the context, you know, God is saying this kind of religion is, is disgusting. And this is the basis for his ultimate judgment of his exiled people. Um, but I did want to, you know, say it's quite important to keep in mind the scope of this judgment. It is not to outside the covenantal community. He's not condemning Egypt for worshiping false gods or the Assyrians for being cruel or you know, the Babylonians for immorality. He's not trying to correct the societal ills outside the covenant community, but inside the covenantal community. Um, so I see this passage more for an opportunity to call out disobedience towards God within our Christian community of those, firstly, who may believe they can appease God with their religious duties on a Sunday and live wicked pagan syncretistic lives, you know, mistreating those around them Monday through Saturday. That is not the religion that God wants. He desires uh, righteous living and adherence to his entire word um, every day, 24 seven. And of course, if one is doing that, then um, there will be a constant flow of, of, of justice towards our, our brother. 
and just a, a side note, as I was, you know, looking at Micah 6, verse 6 to 8, you know, that um, familiar text where, um, you know, it's asked, what does God basically desire? Um, what does he require? The context there is very much the same. You know, he asks the questions, does God want all of our offerings? Does he want tons of, you know, offerings uh, given to him? And of course, the answer was, no, he requires us to act justly, love mercy while humbling with our God, indicating the same thing, the same message. God desires his covenantal community to obey all the Mosaic law, not a picking and choosing. Um, yeah, so that's how I would address it. Brilliant. Thank you so much for walking us through um, that passage in its context and also referring to Micah. Uh, and I would say there's, a, there's an element of... Um, separation that often comes to modern day Christians where we focus on one aspect of justice because we are victims of something and forget the importance of responding to the gospel message that invites us to repentance and to follow after God faithfully. So the combination is that the gospel first and the outflow of a gospel results in walking justly before our God. Thank you so much, Katie. That was brilliant, and I really appreciated uh, the Old Testament nuances that were coming through as you were sharing with us. So, now, I'll move on to uh, the next question we have prepared, and this one is for uh, Pastor Yolanda Julies. Uh, Pastor Julies, social justice has been in the news over the past few months. Uh, some churches have ignored it altogether. Others have equated it with the gospel, and others have taken middle ground. Um, how does a preacher delimit the ministry vocation in face of social unrest? Or put another way, is it the preacher's job to speak on social issues? If so, to what extent can they do so? Over to you. Thank you, Beth. Um. So many of our congregants, they live in communities where they, they experience crises, they experience trauma, gender-based violence. These are the things that they face every day. And we cannot stand apathetic to the threats that they are facing. So as God's messengers of hope, we are to encourage, to comfort, to uplift, and to present the hope that there is in Jesus Christ amid the pain and the sorrow that they are experiencing because we are his arms of compassion, his arms of love. Um, and Because when Jesus saw the crowd in Matthew 9, verse 36, he had compassion on them because they were weary and they were worn out. And he said, because they were without shepherds. Now, as shepherds of the sheep, that is our role to, to instill hope, to encourage and yes, to preach about what they are going through and to help them how to live in that environment, how to frame um, encouragement to their community so that they can present hope to their community. Um, I don't really necessarily preach on social issues all the time, but I do have rhythms that coincide with our national and civic calendar. Um, during August month, we have National Women's Day. We will speak into the issues women face. Um, in July, we have um, Nelson Mandela's, um, um, you know, month. We may speak on leadership and leadership failings. And also we have um, during uh, November, December, the UN has 16 days of activism. We will use that to, to bring for, for um, things that are happening in our community, but there are also special moments that happen in the life of, of our society where trauma happens, where there's an atrocious event. We have to stand still because we cannot be indifferent to the plight of humanity, to what people are experiencing, and also to sensitize our congregants towards the ills in society and towards what they are experiencing. And therefore, we need to teach them how to lament in that moment, how to um, entreat God and to weep for the nation and for the things that are not um, pleasing unto the Lord. It is our responsibility to, to bring that to our congregants, um, especially uh, 
examples would be our Enyo Beni Tavern, um, where 21 of our young people passed on the truck killings that are on our roads. We cannot be silent. Gender-based violence in the Cape Town community, the, host, the children that are being taken hostage. I mean, people are sitting there wondering, will that happen to my child? And we have to present hope. So, um, yeah, so I would say create rhythms. Um, during the year to speak about it, but then have moments where you pause and where you lament when there are things that we cannot overlook that we have to address um, that's happening immediately in our context. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And as you were enumerating some of the matters or issues that the South African community is facing, gender-based violence has been in the news, um, so many uh, issues regarding safety of communities that are vulnerable. Uh, these are deep matters. These are deep fractures within society. And thank you for highlighting the importance of the preacher uh, being attentive to that. Uh, and uh, we appreciate that. I have another question here, and this one is directed to uh, Dr. Nzeno. How does a preacher steward their heart in the face of painful and dehumanizing social injustice. How do you steward your heart as a preacher of a gospel in a missed great social dislocation or injustice? Over to you. Thanks, thanks Dr. Manyuga. <clears throat> it's a deep question. And maybe to take the melancholy out of it, uh, allow me to throw in uh, this. Often when I'm driving somewhere and somebody says to me, uh, drive safe, I often will respond by saying to them, you are directing a good statement, but to the wrong person. Uh, safety belongs to the Lord. My responsibility is just to drive. All that to simply highlight a very important point that it is God who gives us protection. And yes, we have to be responsible. I get all that, but I think for me, uh, Looking at the question, one has to be human first in order to protect others' humanity. I struggle to understand the dehumanization that goes on around us and yet accept those who are perpetuating it as fully human and not to take it from them, but do they understand themselves first as fully human? This I'm saying that I choose then, therefore, not to try to be God and want to protect my heart. I allow myself to be healed of whatever it is that could have stolen any part of what someone's trying to steal, uh, part of what makes me human. And even when I deal with those type of people, I deal with them as fully human, who has been healed so I can be able to minister or deal with them. And so I would give you the just answer that I give that I gave earlier uh, that that belongs to God. Uh, protection of my heart belongs to God. My responsibility is simply on this front to, to ensure that I do not uh, dehumanize anybody because at that action, I'm no longer fully human myself at doing so. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that succinct and very uh, clear answer. I've got another question here, but this was directed to um, Yolanda and to Katie. Um, as a woman, how have you navigated the preaching landscape and what counsel would you give to aspiring female preachers? I know there are different camps uh, in the Christian community. Some camps would say, we will not listen to sermons preached by women. Other camps will say, we will listen to sermons preached by women. That is not the question. Uh, the question is, uh, as a woman, <laughs> how would you navigate the preaching landscape and what counsel would you give to aspiring female preachers? Over to you, ladies. Beginning with uh, Yolanda, then Katie. Over to you. Um, I, uh, I'm very fortunate to have been raised in a church environment that encouraged children and youth to speak. So I regularly get, got to speak in um, 
in in those um, Mother's Day, Youth Day, Children's Day, and also the public places and spaces that I um, grew up in voicing um, and also preaching the gospel in um, conferences. Yeah, so I was really fortunate in that I could live out the calling of preaching in in conferences and um, and we're invited in many forums to preach and teach. But I do understand what people are facing, and therefore my counsel, my advice would be to be faithful to serve in your local context. Um, secondly, prepare yourself with a day when you must step out into public ministry. Thirdly, when the opportunity presents itself, grab them and don't make, make excuses or be insecure about your ability. Allow your confidence to grow in God and allow, um, you know, that that's, when the church invites you to teach on a specific subject, study to show yourself approved and, and do it with all the gusto in you. And then fourthly, be humble, faithful, available, and teachable. And remember, you are herald with a message, a town crier, and no one can stop you except yourself. So your message is not from you, and your message is not for you. Um, therefore, when danger lurks, I wouldn't mind when it is a lady that comes and encourages me um, and sound the alarm, I would be encouraged and say, thank you, Lord, that, um, that she's doing that. So, yeah, I just want to encourage ladies to stand firm and, and, and let their gift, you know, what God has given them, use their gift to honor and, and praise the Lord. But I do understand the context where we find ourselves, if it's important that we honor our leaders, we honor our elders in that regard. Yeah, um, I guess, you know, if I had to give advice, I, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background, um, what advice was given to me. Um, so I, I never knew I had a preaching gift <laughs> until I was forced to take a preaching class in seminary that I didn't even want to take. <laughs> I, I sat under Haddon Robinson um, who, yeah, um, is a big expository preacher um, guy. And um, he pulled me aside after my first sermon that I prepared for class. And he encouraged me, you know, keep at preaching because he could see that God was gifting me in this area. And I was shocked. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't even something I wanted. I, I didn't even want to do this. But yet, um, I began to realize if this really is a gifting in me, then I have a responsibility to use this gifting that God's given me to develop that gifting, um, be practicing it and getting better and better, but, but using it. Um, so, and I remember at seminary uh, sitting under Dr. Aida Spencer, and she would often, you know, uh, teach women's studies and things. And I asked her, you know, what do you do when you're not allowed to speak or teach or preach because you're a woman? And I've always remembered her answer. Um, she said, if there's a boulder in the path, I'm not proud, I'll just go around. Meaning she's not gonna force her way to the pulpit. She's not gonna be divisive and forceful and demand her rights. She will simply and humbly find a place where she's welcome to preach. So I've really tried to live by that same principle. Um, I've tried to be a part of churches that will allow and welcome women preachers to use their giftings there. But we were a part of a church in Zimbabwe uh, for five years that didn't allow women to preach. And I could teach, but um, I couldn't preach. Uh, and eventually, um, you know, I was finding I was being invited throughout the community to be preaching at other people's churches, so much so that we ended up going to our leadership and saying, hey, you know what, I, I'm responsible to use the gift that God has put in me. Um, that's my responsibility before the Lord. And if I'm using that outside this congregation, you know, we feel like perhaps um, it's best that we part ways amicably. It was definitely amicably um, so that I can be in a church where I can use those giftings to bless those people. Um, yeah, so... I would, I guess I would say if you're a lady and you want to be preaching, take the humble approach. Um, and I always just take any and every opportunity that I'm given to preach. I never say no. I take every opportunity. 
Brilliant answers from two seasoned preachers. Uh, one who preached across the ocean, one who preached on trains and has planted churches. Phenomenal in your own right. So we are grateful to God for your gifts. Um, Katie, uh, don't go away yet. Uh, there's another question here for you. Uh, I'll ask this one uh, again uh, to uh, Yolanda as well. Um, and the question is this, as an established preacher in your church, how do you prepare preaching series that address social issues in your context? Over to you. Let's start with Katie and then over to Yolanda. Well, my answer might be a little long-winded, but... Oh, I'm still there. Okay. Um, you know, what I've been noticing, if I actually look at this stuff a bit critically, um, what I've been noticing with the church is we often take the world's agendas and their values concerning social justice, and we baptize them. We adopt them into the church um, without realizing the extent of what we're adopting. Um, so if I might digress here before I give my answer to the question, um, this is kind of the thinking that I've been, you know, churning with. Um, so we, we, yeah, we, we adopt the world's values and agendas for social justice without realizing what we're adopting. Um, for example, one of the first things I see with the world's agendas include values that are actually antithetical to Christianity. Um, for example, um, you all know the Black Lives Matter went all over the world. And, and on the surface, that sounds good, you know. But if you begin to scratch underneath the surface and look at the Black Lives Matter movement um, and what they identify as a movement as their core values, you'll find they want to push radical transgendered sexual ide identity ideology. And they actually promote the breakdown of the family unit. So they're basically for a destruction of the fabric of society. And I ask myself, is that really something that we want to adopt uh, as Christians? That 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 by adopting the Black Lives Matter mantra, do we realize what all we're adopting uh, with that? Um, secondly, the world's social justice agendas, you know, they they seek to try to solve problems by valuing one group over another. You got to push one group down so as to lift the other up. So the world's version, for example, of how to solve racial inequality, uh, gender inequality, gender violence, it seems to be to demonize one group in order to lift up what is called the victimized group. Um, and I noticed this with a movement that became popular in America called the Me Too movement, which encouraged women to share their stories of being sexually harassed or abused to raise awareness of how often it occurs. And the mantra quickly became, believe all women. Um, always believe their stories. They are always right, you know, resulting in this false belief that women are always the victims and men are always the victimizers. Um, you have to demonize and devalue the men to value and uplift the women. And what was the result of this movement? What was so interesting to see is that both genders ended up mistrusting each other. Women were always looking at a man as a deviant sexual harasser, and men were you know, afraid of being around women socially or in the workplace because they may feel falsely accused. They may be accused of sexually, you know, sexual harassment, and they didn't do anything. Um, so what I've noticed is these sexual, um, secular orthodoxies uh, tend to focus on righting the wrongs by pushing one down, to elevate the other, and, and it actually serves to divide us even more. Um, and thirdly, what I've noticed with the world's social justice agendas, um, it's often a adopt a tolerance approach, right? Um, to be tolerant towards any and all kinds of beliefs and lifestyles, and that's the way you heal society's differences. And I think that's most seen in this latest big push for diversity, equity, and inclusion, which in many ways is, is actually a blanket exemption for all to be able to adopt any lifestyle, any morality, any belief system that I want. And it must be tolerated by all because this is who I am. This is my identity. This is my cultural practice, my cultural heritage. You know, this is my religious belief. 
And so tolerance, acceptance for all these differences, the world tells us will lead to unity. Um, and of course, if you try to point out any sort of sinfulness or immorality, you're told that's hate speech and you're quickly named and shamed as a racist or a bigot or whatever. And so I'm very hesitant um, when addressing social issues in the Christian community. I'm very hesitant to just simply adopt the world's uh, social justice agendas and bring them into the church because it it comes with all of these things that I don't think are are helpful and biblical. So as I was thinking how to address society's issues in your context, um, I think you've got to start by preaching the root problem and, and primarily going back to the Imago Day. You've got to start there. Um, the starting point for the world's social justice might, they say, you know, we're valued because, because of the superficial differences of um, race and gender and culture and heritage. That's why we're valued. But in the gospel, the starting point of our value is derived from being created in the image of God. It's the great equalizing truth, you know, that we have inherent value because we are equally, all equally assigned value by our creator. Um, and even actually, I was just looking at um, even in Colossians um, chapter three, verse 10 to 11, you know, that famous verse about there's no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, yada, yada, we're all in Christ. And, and if you look at the context of that verse, the biblical author also realizes that divisions have, they can only fall when you focus on the Imago Dei, the verse before that. He says, um, put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. And then he goes and says, there is no longer Jew or Greek. Even the biblical author in the New Testament recognized the only way to heal differences is the starting point is recognizing the Imago Dei. We are all equally uh, given an assigned value by our creator. So I think it's from that starting point. Then you can address why should we care for the poor? Why should we care for the needy? Why should we see value in other genders and other races or, or see value in our fellow men? You know, it's because we all have bear this uh, assigned value from our creator. And perhaps as a follow up to that, you know, I think it would be a good idea to next preach on the fall of man um, because you know, that is the real root of all of our uh, social injustice problems. It's where injustice begins. It's where the blame get, begins. It's where the hatred towards our brother begins. You know, if there's a restoration first between our God-man relationship, then as an overflow, we can seek to restore the relationship one man to another. The world tries to do just this restoration without this restoration um, sin has to be resolved first in order to see any real lasting justice. So I think I would try to start at the root of the problem first and take it from there. Brilliant. Thank you so much, uh, Katie. Uh, Pastor Yolanda, I'm going to switch gear here um, before we come back to you. There's another question that I have for you. So if we can pause, just hold it for me for a while um, and then I'll come back to you. Uh, Katie, thank you so much for what you just shared with us there, uh, because you did emphasize and underline that we are both victims. We are victims of sin, uh, and we are also perpetrators, and we can't emphasize one at the expense of the other. So we live with this tension of being both a victim and a perpetrator, and the core of a gospel touches on this hybridity of our being, that we need salvation, and that we need a savior, and ultimately, out of that, we can then communicate the salvation that has come to all in Jesus Christ. And then the circles of all the concentric circles can go further from that. Brilliantly put, and thank you so much for that. Now, there's a question that is both for Dr. Nzeno and Pastor Yolanda. And it's a question around South Africa. What social issues do you think preachers in South African churches should openly address and why? So let's begin with Pastor Yolanda, and then we move on to uh, Dr. Nzeno. Over to you. Social issues that um, that mar the dignity of humanity. 
we should treasure that we are God's image bearers and treat each other with respect, honor, and dignity and apply the golden rule, that is, treat others the same way that you would like to be treated. Also, as a young democracy, we are now having multicultural, multi-ethnic churches and which are growing and therefore we should guard against language of exclusion, language that says our people, my people, your people. And we should remember that we are all exiles um, coming <laughs> to this place of the cross, this place of redemption, the church, where we are united as God's um, adopted beloved into the kingdom of God. Um, and therefore we should treat one another like that. Gender-based violence, of course, is something that we need to teach um, our congregants um, um, moral standards and values. And then a one that's very dear to my heart is the role of the fathers. Our fathers should take responsibility in raising their children and not leave it to moms only. Um, there are many gangs, um, recruiters, they are making little child, um, soldiers out of our children. Um, parents and, and people have to be afraid of little seven to 13 year olds to go home who are, who are standing on the corners of the streets because um, of the activities that they are and they're in and the and the hero worship that they have found in these um, leaders, gang leaders that are uh, that are adopting them and 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 yeah. So those are like pertinent issues pressing on my heart when it comes to to my community and and our country and the stuff we are facing um, amongst other things. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Same question to Dr. Nseno, and then I will have time for just a couple of questions in the chat box. Over to you. Sure. Pastor Julius, thank you. I'm glad you went first. And I think to just to anchor what you just said in, in, in retro to say, Dr. Manika, I think what's important, and this should be drilled, uh, it's becoming a social ill. It's not a social ill, but it's becoming a social ill. That every time we're having a dialogue about the ills that we are dealing with, we always have those who hijack the conversation and then pollute the conversation such that it becomes a non-issue when it's supposed to be an issue. As a country, I could say this, we are, we've become a country so good at putting things under the carpet, right? And not dealing with them simply because just when we're starting to have a conversation, we have others who somehow seem to know what's wrong with South Africa and African issues. And I want to maybe highlight this at this point that we need to give ourselves the honesty to come before God and before each other and be accountable of all the troubles. Like, you know, as a man, I can't walk around just because I don't know any woman who has been abused and say there's no women are talking nonsense. I should hush do what you ask me to do. Hush, listen to what others are saying. So instead of bringing social issues that preachers should be attending to, I would encourage uh, those in South Africa, those from South Africa, those who are engaged in the mission field in South Africa, first thing, listen. I park it there. Thank you for parking there. And please wait there. Don't go away. There's a question prepared for you uh, coming from Kenya. Canon Francis Omondi has one for you. He says, the world is quick to complain about injustices before Christians do. They are often right, for the church tends to align with the oppressors. Ellipsis. And the Black Lives Matter image of God should have been spoken by Christians before the world. And if, this, uh, if they spoke, what, what is our value? Why not join them? Uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Nzeno. Well, so, okay, I have a couple... Um, concerns that, like I said, the world's what the world's value system on these things, uh, it's it's never totally Christian, right? It comes with their value system, um, and so um, you know, even Black Lives Matter, I saw lots of Christians trying to respond with the Imago Day, all lives matter. But suddenly, if you say that, which is a biblical truth, if you say that. You were quickly named called and called a racist and a bigot. So I saw churches did try to respond 
um, with perhaps a more holistic biblical viewpoint coming from the Imago Day. And, and you just got name called and shut down. And so it's just zip your lips, right? Um, so what I'm trying to say is, yes, sometimes the world is quick to see injustices, but it always comes from not quite a Christian worldview. And, and so I'm hesitant to adopt uh, these uh, mantras. Um, I, would, I would rather address the issue uh, directly in my church context than take on uh, these um, world uh, agendas. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, let's hear from Dr. Nzeno uh, regarding the same question. I think it's a, it's a live question and it needs uh, a bit more dialogue. So over to you, Dr. Nzeno. Thanks again. Um, and I would want to inter reiterate one more time that one of our biggest challenges, we don't listen to each other and we assume uh, that what we know is better than what the other person is experiencing. And if we could allow the word to be the giver of solutions, but solutions to what? To the questions from the context. And so in that vein, I would like to add the, the response by putting these words together and say, who is the world? I think this dichotomy that we sometimes bring into our theologizing has robbed us of dealing with real issues because somehow we lock ourselves behind pulpits, behind churches, and we are no longer the community. And as if the community, what they're experiencing, is something different than what we are experiencing. When we experience racism, when we experience uh, all these other ills of society, it's not that if you are a Christian, you will not be marked on the road. Who's experienced that? We, the church. And so it's false for us to want to assume, because we are the church, uh, that we will not experience and we should not respond to the things that everyone else is doing it. Well, if they came out with it first, fine, let them be. Where were you when they were reflecting on them? So my point is, the social ills affect us all, Greek, Jew, otherwise. And so there's no need for us to dichotomize our Christianity to our spirituality. Or maybe for us, we don't, we don't have the luxury of separating our spirituality that we carry with us our pain to the Lord and we carry with us our joy back and forth. And there's no time for church. There's no time for being socially responsible or re responsive. So the issue of social responsiveness, it's quite blurred to me, uh, Dr. Manika, I must tell you, because within our churches, our churches became a haven, became our aftercare, uh, became our home. And so the lines between what is church and what is community, it's blurred because in, in all that, we're dealing with the Lord. So there's no time for the Lord to be at home or, or the Lord to be at church. No, it's all in all worship. I park there one more time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, well, I've got two minutes remaining and I know there's so many questions in the chat box. I would like to first say thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you to Pastor Yolanda Yudis, who joined us and shared so passionately and clearly around her journey. Uh, thank you to Kaylee Pelletier, uh, who has done a phenomenal job in training men and women to become good narrative preachers and preachers of a gospel. I uh, sat under one of her sermons, and I can say, tell you, uh, she's the best narrative preacher I know. So thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing uh, your insights with us. And again, thanks to Dr. Nzeno, Reverend Dr. Nzeno, for sharing with us today um, so concisely. And we appreciate the audience who have joined us. Friends, I know there are questions in the chat box, and this is a conversation that may continue in other forums. From my end, it has been a joy uh, just directing traffic around this conversation. May God bless you uh, as we continue uh, with today's e-conference. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much, everyone.